The second question, the second question out of the three is whether Sanskrit is oppressive or liberating. So my experience in Bali, the Balinese regarded as liberating the three hatha cards. Sure, How do that's, they our that, that's our view. That's our Now I'll tell you what their logic is mm -hmm. because I always go into great detail to understand their logic. Their logic for why Sanskrit is actually oppressive. oppressive. Yeah. So the logic of this school is very, very amazing. The logic is that Sanskrit was a source. We shouldn't orientalism by Edward Said blamed Europeans for a lot of oppression and colonialism and these kind of things. But aha, we've discovered that actually they studied Sanskrit and got this idea from Sanskrit. <laughs> that oppressiveness, so they coined the term deep orientalism, which means orientalism that's deep in Sanskrit. Sanskrit structures and Sanskrit texts lend themselves to discourse that is oppressive. And the Europeans came to India, they fell in love with Sanskrit, and they studied these things, and they got the ideas, and then they started oppressing in colonial ways. And the Nazis took the Sanskrit oppressiveness and turned it into the Holocaust. That's what they say. So again, it seems to me a classic psychological projection. It's actually one God theory system, such as Christianity and Islam, that institutionalized the concept of the other, the heathen, the pagan, the kafir, thousands of years ago. But the, except these people are atheists, so they will not promote Christianity or Islam. True, they, they true, will say that, rather that, than saying, noting that those institutions actually institutionalized the other, they're saying actually they were all fine until their encounter with Sanskrit. And so, Sanskrit was, made, was what made them institutionalize right. the notion of the other right. and the oppressed. Right. And the oppressed. See, see, once you remove the sacredness out of Sanskrit, you remove the Parmatika realm out of Sanskrit, you, the transcendental realm out of Sanskrit. So they basically psychologically project anything they want into yes. dead words. Into, into that. So then they, having removed all that, then they're looking for political exploitation and oppression, oppression as the reason for its success. Mm -hmm. So there's, there is a, this grand... Sanskrit cosmopolis, which thrives for all over South Asia and Southeast Asia. What a great thing. And Indians clap, thinking, wow, they're praising us. Mm -hmm. But what they're saying is, when you read beneath the surface, be between the lines, what, what they're saying is that the reason Sanskrit was so successful is because it's so beautiful. It lent itself to the aestheticization of power. Yeah. And it could hide the oppressiveness that, so that everybody sort of compliant with it and they're told all kinds of hum hum mumble jumbo. Now what's the actual oppressive quality? quality of this sense uh, according it, to their exclusion ex exclusion logic. of non brahmins from the power structure from reading sanskrit from doing the yagnas and the king the king depends on the brahmins in order to be boosted through the aestheticization and again, of power they filter out the counterfactuals of the chinese travelers who say that the not only that, were the most wealthy not, of al Biruni. i've given so many arguments about how there was uh, not just those guys but actually real evidence, we had a Shudra dynasty of kings, if, you know, uh, there are so many examples of very successful, powerful people that were Shudras, mm. and there's examples of Shudras becoming landless under the British system, and these landless Shudras became today's disempowered landless laborers, mm. their ancestors were landowners. That's true, even in Tamil Nadu in the Chola kingdom, the cycle of kings would be selected from either a Shudra, Vaishya or Kshatriya class and rotate through. And Prabhudeva Gounder, who went to establish Angkor Wat in Cambodia, actually came from one of those classes. So what they're basically trying to do is equate the Marxist notion of class right. to the notion of Sanskrit caste. Right. That is to or say, varna. varna, say high varna means high wealth, means white slave master, means right. oppressed, right. when actually the Varna of Brahmin was the one who had no money, was in poverty, but right. was the equivalent of the modern day professor at a right. university. Right, right. And a professor who would basically survive on very little material wealth. Right. And he, he was into high learning and he was not into accumulation of wealth, nor did he have political power, which the Kshatriya had. And the quote unquote low Varna, the Shudra, was actually the wealthy landowning class. Right. So it's actually the inversion of the classic Marxist class. Correct. So you see, so. Actually, it's a. Uh, 
decentralized power system with four nodes I mentioned, and corners. I'm, I'm mentioning, I'm describing this whole multiple hierarchies. I'm mm -hmm. calling it multiple hierarchies in our system. Mm -hmm. It's not a single hierarchy. And it actually a, strikes me as a check and balance system. Yeah, if you're a professor, you're focused on knowledge. Right. Well, you have to be in poverty. You have to be a Brahmin, so there's no vested interest. Right. Right. Uh, you're a Shudra, well, you own all the wealth, but if you need knowledge, you have to change your mindset to become a Brahmin. Yeah, it's, it basically keeps the different uh, types of uh, assets, different types of, uh, you know, intellectual property, uh, material, f uh, economic property, mm -hmm. uh, of, you know, physical land property, that sort of a thing, different asset classes into separate hierarchies or mm -hmm. separate orders. Separate orders. orders. Say. orders. Yeah. And so this is a network. Again, I talk about this book as a sort of a network of uh, capital. There are different forms of capital. And it's a liberating form of capital. Yes. Does that explain um, when you read a lot of the uh, Chinese or uh, even Indian records or even the uh, Greek records of Megasthenes, the Greek ambassador, or Al Biruni, they describe a lot of the wealth of India. That's what attracted the, the Europeans in the first place. Do you feel that Sanskrit, this liberating structure, network structure of decentralized power and orders, is that the separation of all of these asset capital, I, I think, the source of wealth creation? I think that we are probably going to, uh, people, economic theorists are probably going to go back to that because right now what you have is you have too much concentration. You have politicians who are supposed to be Kshatriyas also in bed with tycoons, businessmen and becoming billionaires. Mm -hmm. So that's the corruption. Uh, yeah, right. that's a conflict of interest. We actually have centralization of power right. and an imbalance of power right. instead of a decentralized distribution of power. Right, and and shudras are basically people who may not, uh, who basically have uh, today you will say knowledge. Today, a lot of workers who don't own the company, who don't, who are not uh, uh, brahmins in terms of intellectual, they own a lot of equity. Today's, so today you could say that the uh, the 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 ethics of uh, decentralizing you know sweat equity is a, is a way to empower the shudras mm. so these things as long as they're not by birth mm. the only thing i insist on is that it has to be by merit mm. so the varna of a person should be by merit and you don't have to get into the varna system and a ver and a child of somebody who's ex it's really referring to the mental setup of the person is yes. it not yes so there the this school of thought which is coming from kind of a marxist origin of uh, worldwide historical class struggle, these scholars from the school have kind of imbued it with the racial struggle overturn yes. and have separated what used to be occupational asset classes into racial divisions that are fighting each other. Right.